Hi, this is Dr. Scott Young, and today we're going to do a little bit of a different thing. Some of you don't know that one of my favorite areas to talk on is apologetics. A topic that I've spent a lot of time on is called truth and lies and what we believe. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a clue how I look at some of that stuff. Coming right up. <music> And so this is one of my books here. Um, it's called Truth and Lies What We Believe. And we talk about free will versus predestination. Um, I think there's so many cool things that we can talk about in, um, in our belief system <laughs> that will give you an understanding of a, of a different way of looking at this. Because I, I think that we get into too many um, doctrine arguments. Doctrine is what one perceives of the word of God versus theology is the study of the word. So there's a very critical difference between the two of those levels. And um, I think we miss out and we misunderstand. There's this real cool TikTok that we're going to walk through here with this lady who's actually has a master's in divinity, which I, I find completely fascinating. She's got some incredibly good points. Sometimes when you see people talk to <clears throat> guys like um, one of my favorite, Frank Turek, um, who does Cross Examined, um, you can go look it up on YouTube, Cross Examined. He's really good at answering questions. Um, another person is really good too, but he talks on a more general level is Charlie Kirk. And those are two people that talk on different ways, um, specifically, and, and they're, they're going on different paths. Charlie Kirk is a very strong believer as well. But you need to know how you answer people because whether you're in this Nasara kind of phase, whether you're talking about um, apologetics, which is, which is about the word of God, or you're talking about end time issues, you need to have a reason for what you believe. That's what actually the scriptures say. Always have an answer for your faith. And that's what it's really getting into. So we're going to show you this one. We're going to play it. I'm going to pause during some of this parts and we will talk through some of the areas here. So I'm going to bring her up on the stage. Please here. let me go to hell. This is a message to all the Christians on this app on behalf of all the heathens. Please just let us go to hell. Like just let us go there. And we are asking you to let us go there so you don't have to worry about saving us anymore you don't have to comment on everything anymore you can let us go there we it firstly this is fascinating she says let us go to hell it's it's actually a powerful statement of of trying to be in your face now i don't know if she's trying to say this because of her desire to go to hell. No, we'll show you a couple of things that might give you an answer for that. Or if um, she's trying to be out there in your face and push a very particular conversation, but it's fascinating where she goes with this. <clears throat> One of the things you're gonna find is that if when you really study hell, it's way worse than you ever imagined. Some people go, we're have we have a living hell on this earth and i'm going you have no concept in the tribulation we will see parts of hell actually showing up the fifth trumpet we are going to see people killing themselves but not able to die for five months they will wish to die because they're they're bitten by a scorpion type of thing and they will be bitten, but they will. the pain will be so severe, they will try to kill themselves. This is what the word says in Revelation 9, 1 through about uh, a chapter or a verse 12. And, and if this woman really had studied scripture, she could have been there in that particular conversation. But she's missing out on some of the idea here um, and some of the understanding of, of what hell is really about. But she's also pushing back against um, Christians. And you're going to find out she actually was or some level of Christian if she ever, <clears throat> maybe she wasn't really, but 
you're going to find that she actually knows a little bit about what she's talking about here. We want to go there because every day here are the comments that I get. Number one, I'm such an idiot for thinking that the world just popped up into existence because what people will do is say, I believe in God and a creator and it makes more sense because there's creation. So there must be a creator not realizing that they've just placed a middleman in the problem. And okay. So what she's saying here is that there's a cre creation leads to a creator or design point. She skips over the concept of design because creator means someone who designs something. So let me give you an example. If, if I were talking to you, I was sorry, I moved the book. If I talk to you, I'm the writer of the book. In essence, I'm the creator of this. Now, I'm going to tell you something you probably have never heard before. I charge 10 bucks, or I, I set the price on Amazon, $10 for this book. Do you know that on Amazon, and I don't care who you are, if you want to go onto other sites, you'll tell me of other sites. And on Amazon, I make about $2.60. I am the writer of this book. Now, if I went through other kinds of sources, um, you might get, three dollars 350 no i'm still getting the least amount of money upon this book now that's if you order it online or if you know if i bought the book for a, a smaller amount well guess what i that i could i could charge a little bit more i could get the ten dollars off of it so what she's talking about here and i'm not trying to get off on that too much of the topic but what i want you to understand is a creator something that is created means that there's creator which intimates the concept of design and 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 agnostics and atheists love to skip over the concept of design and she misses this point back to the problem up a step and they didn't solve anything because then you have to answer how did god come into existence and if god always existed without being created then you admit that things can exist without creation so here's what she wants to say here that um, so if you back up a step, what she's talking about the, is the ontological argument. Ontological argument means there is a there is a beginning to everything, right? You know, we don't just look at, at a plant and go, "Well, that just came into existence by itself. Someone planted it, right?" Or there were seeds that came from whatever plant that might be, right? Especially if we're looking at corn that we kind of know it's planted. It's not just like weeds in, in the fields or something like that, right? But if we're looking at rows of corn, we know that there was a design process in there. And, and so these people love skipping over this because God actually is the pre-existent point. It blows their mind because they think, well, from my standpoint, I can't imagine anything that is smarter and bigger than me. I, mean, I, I get it. I understand that. But there are things that are smarter and bigger than you. And we could name many, many, many of those things, even in creation and existence that we, we just can't get. And she uses that argument to go farther with this too. So then why can't the universe just exist? And even if you prove deism, you... Why can't the universe exist? Uh, because it has a design. There are structures. There is a distance between the planets. I mean, for instance, the planet Earth is, is at the perfect distance from the sun. There is a perfect amount of temperature variation. There's a perfect way that, that it tips. I'm not, I'm not getting into all the flat earth or conversation with this too, but, but there are so many design points that if you lined up all of the perfection of the nature of, of earth, it is way too coincidental to, to look into that. And these people love skipping over that still have all your work cut out for you in proving that God is in any way good or interacts with the world or is worthy of worship or which one is the right God. You live. So now she moves into another concept. She talks about, is God good? Okay, wait a second. Where did we go from creation to God is good? Do you, I want you to catch this inside of her viewpoint. This is her primary motivator. And I was talking to a guy named Blake and Blake, hey, we were talking, actually can't believe we're, we're talking on the same concept of what I was actually planning on doing today. But 
one of the things you need to know is what is the mentality of that person? So when you watch Charlie Kirk and he does some of these, these interesting talks, or whether you watch Frank Turek or other people who are really good at looking at the apologetics, the key that you need to see is sit back for a second. Why are they asking the questions? Why are they framing their statements in the way that they do? This is her key. God in her mind is not good. So she sees this all the evil in the world, and she's got to go, well, then God isn't good. And the answer is God set up the rules, set up the consequences for not following the rules, but gave, a, but gave humans a way out. But you have to allow for free choice. And that's the scary part for the agnostic and for the atheist because they can't perceive of a God who wouldn't be intimately involved in every little thing like stopping, you know, a criminals from doing the crime, whatever that crime might be, right? We look at that and go, you, God has got to be good enough to want to stop that. And the answer is he actually created a way for that to be stopped, but he didn't, but he allowed free will, which means that, that, humans will impinge upon one another in that free will. And that is the sad part of our existence. That's the part, that's the issue that, that plagues the Christian, the non-Christian and all these other religions that she start. Now she starts floating into other religions and that's a whole nother conversation as well. Literally solve nothing by adding God to the mystery of existence. The most rational response to looking at the universe and the origins of the universe and the origins of consciousness is to say, I don't know, not let me ask what first century Palestinians thought since they didn't even know that germs made us sick. Maybe we can just leave them where they are and have a modern conversation about the mysteries of the universe. No, there's a good point there. Um, should we have a modern conversation about the mysteries in the universe? Of course we should. Now, but she's saying that, that, that the Bible can't tell us anything. Do you know that in John 19, um, 31 through <coughs> verse 37, I can prove the Bible actually knew a plasma because in Jesus, when the wound was, when he was pierced in the side, it went into the pericardial sac and it says blood and water flowed. Now, if you were any person who were just trying to make the Bible make sense, you would never say blood and water flowed because you would never have seen blood and water. No one Whoever writes a book, if you were writing fiction or nonfiction, you wouldn't say someone pierces into someone's side and then blood and water comes out. It makes no sense. It, this is what blows these people's mind. Did you know that plasma wasn't as, actually invented as a concept until after World War I? You go, what? <laughs> um, absolutely. So the Bible has been presented and represented over and over again and gets those verses right and tells you about a technology called plasma that we can separate the components of the red blood cells into that clear fluid of plasma. And what it did when Jesus was on the cross, when they pierced into his side, because you could not let someone off of a cross until you prove that he was dead. So if he's playing possum up on the cross and acting like he was dead, which probably happened more times than not in the first century of, of the Roman, you know, the Roman situation of, of any type of death, forget about just crucifixion. If, if they were going to sentence someone to die, they were not allowed to come off until you made sure that they were dead. And that's why they pierced into his side. So if they pierced into his side and, in, and just blood came out, well, then they would have killed him, right? If they pierced into his side and blood and water came out, it says in the book of John in chapter 19, like I was talking to you about, is that John is saying he was already dead. Well, guess what happens when you die? After about three minutes in your pericardial sac specifically, and it floats out to the rest, part, rest parts of your, the rest of the parts of your body, sorry, is that 
it separates into the blood components. That's why blood cannot be just capped. No matter how much we refrigerate it, we have to separate it out into plasma. And only in World War II did we start to use plasma on the battlefield, and more specifically in Korea and, and on from there. So what happens here is that the Bible gets so critically right by saying blood and water because that's exactly what it would look like. Do you see, I just proved to you the Bible is true, and yet this would blow her mind because she's thinking that a first century uh, conversation could have no relevance to today. Unfortunately, she misses that point. But there are ways to have modern conversations, just like I'm doing here with you. Number two, I get just read the Bible. I have a master's degree in theology. I studied medieval exegesis. And they say that as if there's only one interpretation or message of the Bible when there is not one single doctrine, not one, that is consistent throughout the Bible. This is why you can use the Bible to do just about anything. The Bible solves nothing. It is just a complex, long-form conversation. Where okay, so we just gave you one. First off, she has said it's an interpretation that can say anything it wants to. I just showed you the death and resurrection of Christ. I mean, or the, excuse me, the death. In the resurrection of Christ in John 20 verse one, it says that the stone was rolled away. Now, if you look at other ones or it says moved out of the way or you know, pushed out of the way and, you, and, and, and it says it different ways, but what the word in Greek is, is the stone was arrow, A-E-R-O, which means forced into the air out of position. It's where we come up with the word called aeroplane. When the Wright brothers, you know, became the one of the first people, at least as far as we know, to actually fly a plane, they called it aeroplane. Now we just call it airplanes today, right? A-I-R, but they used the word arrow from the Greek terminology which means there was an explosive event that happens inside of the tomb. Wow, that tells you that there could have been as much as a nuclear level reaction to have the every, from every pore of his body, there was a nuclear reaction that happened to make the Shroud of Turin. Holy cow, it fully lines up with scripture and even scripture infers it in different ways. Actually, in the word, it over and over. So inconsistency, the word says over and over that the law tells us about sin and that all men, all women have sinned. It's consistent throughout the Bible. It doesn't miss this, but see, she doesn't want to believe that because she's pulling some other statistics or some other thoughts in her mind, and she's been corrupted in her viewpoint. Unfortunate. You can glean wisdom, but there's not anything there that you can use as a foundation to build a life. Number three, you have no foundation for morality. This one I get a lot, as if the Bible gives you an objective foundation for morality. It can't even say that slavery or genocide is wrong. Morality has always been a conversation. And if you study the Bible long enough, like really study it, you can watch that conversation happen. And you can- Okay, and this is a really powerful one when you, when you say there's no morality. Um, morality is, a, is outside of oneself. Now, rules, and she puts in here, and you're going to see her talk about rules and ethics. Watch this. You can watch rules change. You can watch God change his mind. It has always been relative morality. Okay, you cannot equate rules and morality. Rules and ethics are things, are interpretations that man comes up with. Like, for instance, and I remember this very clearly when I was early driving on, or early on driving, excuse me, is that we had 55 mile hour speed limit. And that was a, a nationwide issue that happened. The rule morphed over time. And there are t places, obviously, you can go 65 miles on some particular roads. But by the way, at the time, in the 70s, I think it was late 70s or early 80s, when we started noticing that at, it was every single major highway or freeway and highway all had 55 miles an hour. That was the top speed you could ever go. Now, there are obviously speed limits below that. 
And so why did they change it to 65? There are places in Oklahoma that is 70. Do you know that if you drive down Wyoming, there are 80, <coughs> 85 mile an hour speed limits in 90s? It's because we're talking a morphing over time of rules or ethics that are changed. And some people rise ethics up with what man thinks of to morality. Now, this is one of the most powerful things that we're gonna, I'm gonna end up to, and I'm gonna show you more. I'm gonna skip forward here in a minute. But morality comes from God. One of the most powerful points that you need to understand is this, this area. If I don't believe, if I don't believe in God, or I am an agnostic, or I am an atheist, as she might be one of those two, maybe she's just calling herself an agnostic, um, I can choose to say, it's not a sin to murder. I can choose to say, it's not a sin to rape. It's not a sin to pillage. It's not a sin to do any kind of thing out there. As long as I don't get caught, I can say, I, I'm okay with it. Because if I am okay with it, as long as um, I don't get caught, I'll keep doing it. Because those are my rules. Now, if you say to me, well, it's wrong to do it. Society creates it. Who told society that could create it? We know that in Nazi Germany and in, by the way, in every country of the world, there is there are always people who change the rules for themselves. So they throw up morality all the time and they, they corrupt it in this way. Those are rules. Where do we get the concept that it is wrong to murder? From the Bible, from it's an authority above us. And this is what these people hate in the way that I would say that to them because she doesn't understand the difference between rules and morals. Even in religion. And as we learn more and we share more stories, we have more empathy and that leads to more moral behaviors where we recognize that I am you and you are me and you seem to be. A How can you have a moral behavior? Who says, which moral are we talking about? Her morality, my morality, Joe's morality, Jim's morality. Whose morality are we talking about? Oh, a group thought. Well, uh, then we have then we have democracy. Well, you know that democracy is just a group uh, a group mob rule, just like I told you with the fifty five mile hour speed limit. It was just a rule that they came up with. What if they? What if sixty two percent of the population says, you know what, it's okay to murder? Well, then it would become the rule. And yet, how did these people answer that? That's not a moral. Do you see how we kind of get there with this too? So we're gonna skip ahead a little bit here. I'm gonna show you some interesting statements you said. It is hubris at its finest, and I, I can't do this from men. Will either comment or message me, or try to meet with me, or send me their books saying, I know the secret pattern. I know my way to weave through the Bible like no one else can, and I know the real truth of what's going on here. Men have sent me their theologies and their books, and they all believe that, um, of all the humans that have ever existed, they have the one that they are the ones that have figured it out. It is hubris at its finest. Now she doesn't want to hear the truth, by the way, too. Would I spend a lot of time with her and trying to change her mind? No, she's made up her mind. She's very, very clear in making up her mind. Now you have to respect someone's choice, like this woman who's made a very strong choice about what she wants to believe. Totally fine. Um, as long as she's not impinging upon me and she's saying don't impinge upon her, fine. She has the right in a real free society to believe whatever way she wishes to. So I wouldn't try to change her viewpoint. It's a really important point for us, okay? Because she doesn't want you to change her viewpoint. But here's where she gets a little bit funky when she goes off on this. And I, I, can't, I can't deal with it anymore. And last, sometimes at the end of a conversation, when someone is getting mad at me in the comment section, they'll just say, enjoy hell. And can I say, I will, because do you know what Tertullian, the early church father said when he was asked what was so great about going to heaven? He said, you get to stand at the edge of heaven and look down at the damned. And okay, first off, she's, she's quoting a person, a very church, early church father, and she's talking about how 
That perception was that we could stand on the cliff's edge of heaven and look down at the damned. Like, is that anywhere in the Bible? And the answer is zero places in the Bible. So that particular doctrine by a church leader has nothing to do with the word. So how can we infer that's what heaven is really like? Heaven has nothing to do with what she just said. And so her argument is flawed from the beginning. Don't get into arguments that they, 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 have, no, they have no meaning in that way. Let, sorry, but let dummies say whatever they want to say, okay? If they want to make up dummy statements like this, that makes no sense because they're pulling out that and they're trying to say that that's what's in the Bible. That's not what heaven is really about. Heaven is a place of unimaginable joy and that wouldn't be joy for me to look down at the damned. That would not be fun. Then guess where she goes with the next part of this as well. And I know that's what you want. You want that moment where the whole world says that you were right and you want to stand in heaven. And the great thing about standing in heaven is you get to look at me burning in hell because I believed in wrong things. Uh, like, why would I want to be looking at her and, and, and lording it over her? I mean, this is the sick mentality of these people, unfortunately. And you know what? You have to let them be there. They need to reach the pit of their life. And some people have made the choice not to believe. This is definitely a woman who's made her choice not to believe. Now we can have pity on her. We can have, um, I mean, we can, we can have compassion for her, but we have to allow when someone does that. I know that's going to sound crazy to you, but she has really made a strong choice. But it's a misperception because here's what she's going to say at the end here. In the wrong thing. But can I just say that me and anyone else who follows me on this app who is going to hell, um, we cannot wait. We cannot wait to go because there's going to be no hypocritical, fascist, nationalist, cruel, arrogant Christians on here or in hell that are going to be there. And so I cannot wait. It's going to be a great time. And there she gets to her big ba basic point with that too. So as we kind of end up here, what I want you to understand is that some people have really horrible mentalities of things. They have broken viewpoints and most of it comes in pain. Most of it comes in a pain of, of a loss during a time frame <clears throat> that broke their ideas. Some other comes from rebellion. Um, maybe and, and many uh, uh, many of author that I've, I've checked out and, and when I've done my own studies with that is that they'll they'll say these people that that go this direction unfortunately are there because they wish to sin there was a desire for that rebellion and the rebellion could be a sexual rebellion it could be a a monetary rebellion it is a rebellion of some different type and it becomes a choice. And what, <clears throat> what will God will do near the end of a person's life, and, and by the way, he's been, he's been reaching out to these people in different ways. He will come to them and, and, and share, I mean, give them all the opportunities to come to it. Now, maybe at her deathbed, she comes back from it, but she might not. Do we keep planting seeds and freak out about her? Go ahead if you got, want to, guys. I'm not trying to like bash her in this way, but she's clearly made that choice. So ask yourself, is that what God wants you to invest in? Invest in someone in that way? Or does God saying, you know what? I'm letting you do exactly what you've chosen. It's a real interesting statement that, that happens in the Gospels repeated over and over. And Jesus has these children. Now, I want you to leave with this one point. Jesus has the children coming up to me. He goes, don't hinder them. Don't, don't pull them back because the disciples are kind of, you know, pushing them off. And, and he goes, don't, don't hinder the little kids. And he goes, he goes, anyone who harms them, it would be better if they put a millstone around their neck and drop themselves into the sea. I go, wow, that's a really powerful statement. He's talking about the judgment the judge is talking about a judgment to come. And, and do you think that would be a pretty nice way to die? Well, that is actually 
saying, I'm letting you over to your depravity, unfortunately. That's what hell is. And it's not a depravity of going, oh, this was the cool stuff I wanted to do with all my friends. And we get to be down there without hypocrites. No, you're going to be down there with the hypocrites. You're going to be down there with your sin. And it is going to accuse you every single day. And it will torture you in ways that you can't imagine in hell. If you'd like to know more about it, leave a comment down there. Happy to talk to you about that. Thanks so much.